ideas and also contribution for organizing uh, this seminar. So I'm trying to introduce or make some uh, introduction about what are we going to do in this uh, webinar. Can you uh, show my PowerPoint? Yes, okay, thank you very much. So the title of the webinar is very interesting. <clears throat> the innovative concept regarding structure for early detection and treatment of hearing problems in children and babies in Indonesia. So this is, uh, again, back to the issue of uh, introduction and new things. Uh, we have uh, many, many uh, hearing problems, but the point is, it's not yet uh, put into policy agenda. Okay, so next slide for this, yeah. So when we look at the landscape of our uh, problems, we have the life cycle concept that's already introduced by the Minister of Health from the life cycle from uh, infant, childhood, early adulthood, and then also the mature and also the senior one. And we have the promotive programs, detection and the prom uh, treatment. And we can see that uh, this seminar is concentrated in the uh, infant and the childhood or the hearing problems. And we do understand that the burden of disease at the later stage of the life is huge but little financial support. So that's why we, we introduced this uh, webinar and after my uh, introduction, there will be uh, opening speech from the Ministry of Health for how we tackle this uh, problem in the future. Okay, so back to the issue of the introduction of new things. And this is the uh, main theme of this uh, webinar. Okay, let's go to the... Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, at current, so we uh, understand that ENT program is not yet in government priority at the moment, and there's no central government ENT hospital. That is uh, uh, the fact. Uh, we do have some uh, specialized hospital like uh, cardiology, uh, lungs, uh, <clears throat> neurology, and also eye hospitals. But we, we don't have... Uh, ENT hospital, although the private sectors, they have some uh, special hospital for ENT. Yeah. And then the early detection is not yet in the routine program. So this is the, the current situation. And that's why we need a policy recommendation for the future development of uh, early diagnosis and uh, prompt treatment for uh, hearing problems, especially in the babies and the children. Okay. Start, please. Yeah. <clears throat> and then... Uh, why this webinar is also uh, organized in university environment. And the speaker, uh, I think from the Europe, also some come from uh, university hospitals in, in Germany, and then also from the industry. And then if you look at the scientific structure of hearing problems uh, and the early diagnosis and prompt treatment, we can see that uh, there are many disciplines in our faculty. Yes, we have the ENT department here, but also we have the pediatrics uh, department for uh, the new babies and also the child. Yeah, Also the neurology department, but also we have the public health sciences, including the health policy uh, sciences uh, for tackling these problems. The technology of the medical device for uh, this early diagnosis and prompt treatment and Last but not least, we have to have like a business and economics uh, calculations of what's uh, the prospect of the program. Is it possible to be financed by the government? Or also we have to go to the public and uh, private uh, partnerships. So when we have to tackle the hearing problems, uh, university uh, department cannot uh, work alone. Yeah. So we have to work together in a good uh, transdisciplines uh, activities. Oh, okay, this uh, second, uh, the, the next slide, please. And then the approach of the transdisciplinary is very, very important for making a policy recommendation. And this is a wide intention of having this webinar is not only uh, the first webinar, this one, but it will be followed by activities concerning uh, policy recommendations, but using a transdisciplinary approach. Yeah. Okay, a slide, please. Yeah. So this is a like what was like the description of the transdisciplinary. 
uh, at university, especially in the medical sciences, we have some like old uh, solution of uh, tackling the problems. Uh, we have uh, all solution, but uh, based on its a uh, science uh, activity like biology, economics, or policy solutions, uh, we don't have like a shared methods. Mm -hmm. But the transdisciplinary, it is uh, totally different. We have uh, many sciences like uh, in ENT, like neurology, pediatrics, public sciences, business and economics, uh, and technology, uh, technical sciences. And then we have to define a problem and then share methods and the policy uh, policy solution is like the amalgamation or the combinations of every science that is um, related to hearing uh, problems. So this is the point that we uh, come together in this webinar. Next slide, please. This is the example of one in, uh, nice uh, explanation of the transdisciplinary. So we have to look at uh, back to the issue of the real world situations and the academic uh, situations. When we look at uh, the real world problems, the hearing problems is a uh, real problems in the world, also in Indonesia at the moment. Okay, but how to solve the problems? We have to um, input or make this uh, real world problems into the academic or, or non-real. Uh, world. So we have to make a research, we have to make a discussion, and then trying to have like a concept for tackling the problems in a transdisciplinary manner. So the combination between uh, policy makers, uh, actors in the real world, includes the, the industry of the medical devices, and the researcher, the academics in the university, it is very, very important for bringing the spirit of transdiscipline into uh, problem solving in the real world. Okay, slide please. So this is my last uh, slide, expectations. We have a big expectation after this webinar. Uh, I hope that there will be a small group for proposing policy recommendation to central and the local government for implementing hearing problems, detection and treatment. And then there should be a comprehensive policy analysis includes how the financial aspect of the program. So we don't uh, analyze only the technical matters, but also we have to look at the broader uh, aspect, including how to finance the early detection and prompt treatment, whether it will be funded by a government or by uh, national health insurance or by private uh, funding. So it is a matter of how we we can analyze uh, the situations. That's why uh, we hope that this is not the first uh, event and then or the first program and then uh, finish after this webinar. So thank you very much and for everybody, for the speaker from the overseas, from uh, Professor Isubnandar in Paris that initiated this program, uh, for the MOH that will be like uh, the target for the policy recommendations and everybody who supported uh, this uh, event in terms of scientific development. So enjoy the webinar and see you later after the seminar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Laksono, for the speech and also the insight that has been given. Next, we will listen to the keynote speech by Dr. Eva Susanti as the Director of Non-Communicable Diseases Control and Prevention, Ministry of Health, Republic Indonesia. To the Honorable Dr. Eva, or maybe the representative of Dr. Eva, the time is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat siang. Selamat siang, Dok. Salam, salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Mohon izin, Mbak, suara saya kedengaran nggak ya? Iya, terdengar dengan jelas, Dokter. Iya. Ah, uh, yang saya hormati, 
Staf Khusus Menteri Kesehatan Bidang Ketahanan Industri Obat dan Alat Kesehatan Prof. Paksono Kemudian Direktur Utama Rumah Sakit Anak dan Bunda Harapan Kita Jakarta Kepala Departemen THTKL Fakultas Kedokteran dan Kesehatan Masyarakat serta Keperawatan Universitas Gajah Mada Profesor Dr. Matt Catherine uh, Neumann Direktur of Departemen Oponiatrik and Kedodologi at the University Clinic of Master Jerman, Peter Bocer, CEO Pet Medical, kemudian Prof. Nilo Purnami, uh, spesialis THT BKL, guru besar dalam bidang neurologi AP Komunitas Universitas Airlangga, juga sebagai Ketua Komite Daerah Penanggulangan Gabungan Pendengaran Provinsi Jawa Timur, kemudian para undangan serta hadirin sekalian yang berbahagia. Uh, pertama-tama adalah kita panjatkan puji dan syukur karena Allah Subhanahu wa taala yang telah melimpahkan rahmat kepada kita semua sehingga pada hari ini kita dapat menghadiri acara webinar dalam rangka peringatan Hari Peninggalan Sunnia tahun 2004 dengan topik inovatif konsep regarding structure for early detection and treatment of hearing problem in children and babies in Indonesia. Pada kesempatan yang istimewa ini Saya sampaikan terima kasih kepada panitia atas penyelenggaraan acara ini dan kepada segenap hadirin yang telah meluangkan waktu untuk hadir secara luring maupun secara daring mengikuti acara kita pada hari ini. Apresiasi, apresiasi juga saya sampaikan kepada Miss Catherine Neumann dan Mr. Peter Bacer yang sudah berkenan menjadi pembicara pada webinar hari ini. Sungguh merupakan suatu kebahagiaan bagi saya untuk bisa mendapat kesempatan hadir menyampaikan kata sambutan sekaligus membuka acara yang penting ini mewakili Bapak Dirjen P2P Direktorat Jenderal Pencegahan dan Pengendalian Penyakit. Hadirin yang berbahagia, gangguan pendengaran sangat berpengaruh terhadap komunikasi, kemudian kesejahteraan, peluang karir akademis dan profesional, serta kemandirian ekonomi dan kualitas hidup masyarakat. Untuk itu, WHO bersama seluruh negara fokus terhadap permasalahan gangguan pendengaran melalui World Report on Hearing tahun 2021 dan sesuai dengan tujuan SDG, SDG untuk bisa menghimbau negara-negara untuk bisa mempromosikan kesehatan telinga dan pendengaran untuk semua orang melakukan tindakan alternatif dalam upaya memenuhi kebutuhan orang dengan gangguan pendengaran serta populasi yang bersiko terhadap gangguan pendengaran dan kutubnya. Gangguan pendengaran menjadi penyebab disabilitas terbesar keempat secara global, di mana Badan Kesehatan Dunia tahun 2021 menyebutkan sekitar 65 persen disabilitas disebabkan oleh gangguan pendengaran sedang hingga berat. Permasalahan ketulian yang tidak diatasi juga menimbulkan beban ekonomi yang tinggi di seluruh dunia. WHO juga memperkirakan pada saat ini kerugian akibat gangguan pendengaran yang tidak ditangani mencapai kurang lebih 1 triliun dolar per tahun belum lagi ditambah dengan perlunya biaya dukungan pendidikan, kemudian hilangnya produktivitas dan biaya sosial lainnya, dan tanpa tindakan khusus, maka jumlahnya akan terus meningkat. Bapak-Ibu, saudara-saudara sekalian yang berbahagia, World Report on Hearing 2021 menyebutkan bahwa satu dari lima orang atau sekitar 1,5 miliar penduduk dunia mengalami gangguan pendengaran, yaitu kondisi penurunan fungsi pendengaran dengan ambang batas pendengaran lebih dari 20 desibel atau ambang batas pendengaran normal, Kemudian sekitar 430 juta orang diantaranya memerlukan layanan, layanan rehabilitasi untuk gangguan pendengaran bilateral yang dialami dan hampir 80% orang dengan gangguan pendengaran berada di negara dengan tingkat pendapatan menengah ke bawah. Tanpa upaya penanggulangan yang intensif, maka diperkirakan satu dari empat orang atau sekitar 2,5 miliar penduduk dunia akan mengalami gangguan pendengaran pada tahun 2050. Dari data Lancet dalam kurun waktu 25 tahun terakhir, prevalensi gangguan pendengaran itu meningkat dari 14,3 persen menjadi 18,1 persen pada tahun 2015 dan populasi dunia uh, di mana semua gangguan pendengaran dari 5,7 persen menjadi 6,4 persen yang merupakan gangguan pendengaran sedang sampai berat. Prevalensi global gangguan pendengaran tingkat sedang hingga berat ini meningkat seiring bertambahnya usia, namun sekitar 60% gangguan pendengaran ini sebenarnya dapat dicegah faktor risiko yang paling utama dan banyak ditemukan oleh karenanya adalah infeksi telinga, khususnya otitis media supratif, kronis, kemudian rubella, campak, gondok, meningitis, kemudian sitomegalovirus kongenital, ototoksik, dan paparan kebisingan di tempat kerja atau rekreasi. 
Di Indonesia sendiri, prevalensi gangguan pendengaran penduduk usia 5 tahun ke atas sebesar 2,6 persen, artinya 2 sampai 3 dari 100 orang mengalami gangguan pendengaran. Angka ketulian sebesar 0,09 persen, kemudian seru main prop sekitar 18,8 persen, dan sekret di liang telinga sekitar 2,4 persen. Sedangkan estimasi WHO insiden bayi lahir tuli berkisar 0,1 sampai 0,2 persen dengan angka kelahiran sekitar 2,6 persen, maka setiap tahunnya diperkirakan terdapat sekitar 5.200 bayi lahir tuli di Indonesia yang bersikap mengalami hambatan dalam proses belajar mengajar dan kemampuan berbicara. Selain itu, kasus infeksi telinga juga menjadi salah satu penyebab terbanyak kasus gangguan pendengaran pada anak yang diperkirakan sekitar 22,6 persen adalah kasus OMSK terjadi pada anak berusia di bawah 5 tahun Selain infeksi pada telinga, paparan suara bising juga merupakan faktor risiko bagi anak-anak dan dewasa bukan hanya terhadap terjadinya gangguan pendengaran namun juga masalah kesehatan akibat bising lainnya seperti insomnia dan penyakit jantung. Paparan kebisingan dengan intensitas di atas 80 desibel pada durasi lebih dari 40 jam per minggu dapat menyebabkan gangguan pendengaran dengan merusak sel-sel rambut sensorik di dalam telinga bagian dalam. Saudara-saudara sekalian, Bapak Ibu semua yang saya hormati, Hari Pendengaran Sudinia pada tahun 2024 mengusung tema dengan tema internasional Changing Mindset, Let's Make Ear and Hearing Care a Reality for All Dan tema nasional adalah Ubah Pola Pikirmu, Mari Peduli, Tuli Dapat Kita Tangani Tema tersebut mengandung pesan yang sangat penting agar masyarakat menyadari pentingnya menjaga kesehatan pendengaran Kemudian upaya menjaga gangguan pendengaran serta pemahaman masyarakat bahwa Tuli dapat didet deteksi lebih awal dan ditangani sesuai dengan indikasi. Mencegah gangguan pendengaran untuk kualitas pendengaran yang tetap baik dan terjaga di masa depan. Terkait hal ini, promosi untuk mencegah gangguan pendengaran melalui perilaku dan tindakan deteksi dini yang efektif serta penggunaan alat pelindung pendengaran penting untuk dilakukan. Sehingga bila ditemukan sedini mungkin gangguan pendengaran, dapat kita minimalisasi dengan penanganan yang tepat sesuai indikasi. Di samping itu, upaya rehabilitatif dengan alat bantu dengar, implan koklea, dan terapi rehabilitatif kemudian bahasa isyarat merupakan solusi yang dapat memastikan bahwa orang dengan gangguan pendengaran dapat memiliki akses dalam berbagai aspek sehingga memiliki kesempatan untuk bisa memenuhi potensi mereka. Pada webinar hari ini merupakan kehormatan bagi kita dengan kehadiran ahli dari Departemen Opponetrik dan Pedologi dari Universitas Klinik Master Jerman untuk bisa memberikan banyak input bagi kita semua bagaimana upaya deteksi dini dan penanganan gangguan pendengaran pada anak dan bayi, serta bagaimana konsep layanan yang diterapkan. Saya berharap teman-teman semua, terutama dari program, kemudian klinisi, serta akademisi, dapat mengikuti acara ini untuk dapat mengambil manfaat untuk implementasi program penanggulangan gangguan pendengaran dan ketulian di Indonesia, khususnya gangguan pendengaran pada bayi dan anak. Bapak-Ibu semua, saudara-saudara sekalian yang berbahagia, Pemerintah berkomitmen untuk menurunkan angka gangguan pendengaran dan ketulian di Indonesia. Upaya ini tentunya butuh dukungan dari berbagai pihak, mulai dari puskesmas sebagai ujung tombak pelayanan kesehatan, kemudian rumah sakit daerah, sampai dengan rumah sakit rujukan tersier dan ditunjang dengan kesiapan sumber daya manusia dengan sarana-prasarana yang memadai, termasuk dukungan lintas sektor, akademisi, organisasi profesi, maupun mitra terkait lainnya yang diperlukan untuk membantu pemerintah dalam mendekatkan akses bagi masyarakat dalam mensosialisasikan, mengedukasi masyarakat sehingga gangguan pendengaran dapat dicegah dan dikendalikan serta menciptakan kondisi yang inklusi bagi kita semua. Semoga semua upaya yang telah sanakan memberikan manfaat bagi masyarakat dan mendapat ridho dari Allah Subhanahu wa taala. Akhirnya dengan mengucapkan bismillahirrahmanirrahim dengan ini webinar inovatif konsep regarding structure for early detection and treatment of hearing problem in children and babies in Indonesia saya buka secara resmi. dari Dr. Dr. Maxi Ren Rondonungu DHSM Mars. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Dr. Eva untuk pembukaan yang telah diberikan. Thank you for Dr. Eva uh, for the speech given. Uh, well, this time we'll have a panel presentation session which will be moderated by Dr. Dian Kesuma Pramudia Nurputra, MHC PhD.
Here is the curriculum vitae of Dr. Dian. Uh, he is a otolaryngologist or ENT at the Sarjito Hospital, Yogyakarta. To the Honorable Dr. Dian, the time is yours. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good afternoon in Indonesia and good morning in Germany. Uh, thank you, Ms. Astor, for introducing myself. Allow me to make a little bit correction. Actually, I'm not an otolaryngologist. I'm a pediatric neurologist. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, lead the discussion uh, within today. So uh, we will have several speeches uh, from our uh, accomplished uh, speakers, which is Professor Dr. Met Catherine Newman, Mr. Peter Potcher, and Prof. Uh, Professor Nye Polimanya. Okay, so um, without further ado, we would like to invite Professor Dr. Met Catherine Newman for uh, giving her first uh, presentation. However, before we start to listen to Professor Catherine's presentation, allow me to read a little bit of her CV. So, Professor Dr. Met Catherine Newman is an accomplishment I have been recognized. Uh, she was uh, a highly accomplished doctor with uh, 36 years of experience in otolaryngology, phoniatrics, and pediatric audiology. And uh, throughout her career, she already established lots of papers, including around 996 papers. Wow. So her accomplishment has been recognized with several awards, such as the European Phoniatrics Healing Award and the Medic. Medal of Merit of the German Society for Phoniatrics and Pediatric Audiology. She is now actively involved in various professional organizations and committees, including the World Health Organizations and International Associations of Locopedics and Pediatrics. So, uh, without further ado, we invite Professor uh, Newman. So, Professor Newman, could you hear our voices? Hello? Yeah. Professor Catherine? Yes, I, yes, I can hear you. Okay. And if so, you allow uh, me. Okay, Professor Catherine, please, uh, screen and time is yours. Yes, I try to share my screen. And so. Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, okay, and you can do the slideshow. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Selamat pagi, hadirin sekalian. So these are my only <laughs> Indonesian <laughs> words. <laughs> I hope it was Indonesian. I am glad to share with you my and an international knowledge about uh, early uh, yeah, hearing detection and intervention for children who are born with uh, hearing loss. And uh, I'm very hopeful that we get it implemented also in Indonesia. Thank you for the nice introduction. And now... We are here. So you might know that uh, babies, fetuses, already here inside of the belly of their mother. Uh, but if they uh, come to birth, the auditory pathway must mature. You see it on the pictures here on the right side. There are some basal maturation processes of the neural structures of the auditory pathway. This is sprouting of dendrites, spines, forming of synapses, stabilization of used connections, and the degeneration of unneeded ones. So it is a cascading sequence of opening and closing developmental time windows for these processes during the last prenatal weeks and the first postnatal months. Uh, we, cause, we call them sensitive maturation phases. If 
a neonatal hearing loss is not treated during this very narrow period, the results of, a, of, of subsequent therapies will reveal only deficient outcome. So time is running. And uh, it has been shown that infants with hearing loss who receive early intervention before six months of age have better outcomes than infants who begin intervention later. It's very clear. Congenital hearing loss uh, is among the most common congenital disorders, has a prevalence between one to three per thousand babies. This is more than all the other diseases together you can screen for in neonates. An un- or undertreated hearing loss imposes a significant burden on individuals, in particular if it starts early in life. A permanent childhood hearing loss, I call it later PCHL, is associated with deficits in language, cognitive, psychosocial, and academic development, uh, with negative consequences for employment and earnings later and for families. Newborn hearing screening, in particular when it is perm uh, performed universally for all newborns in a hospital, region, a federal, state, or nation. And we, we call it then UNHS, Universal Newborn Hearing Screening. And when followed by prompt and appropriate interventions, brings significant advantages by reducing the age of diagnosis and intervention, improved language and cognitive development, translating into improved social and educational outcomes. There's long-term evidence for this statement coming from huge um, longitudinal studies, an Australian Lodge study and uh, UK studies. So it's very, very clear that this is the case. And therefore, the Joint Committee on Infant Hearing of the United States several times uttered the AD, Early Hearing Detection and Intervention, 136 guidelines, meaning uh, that uh, newborn hearing screening should be performed before the first month of age of a baby. Audiological diagnosis, uh, which confirms uh, a hearing loss, has to happen before the third month of age and start of intervention up to the sixth month at latest. Um, so, do we have technical opportunities for the hearing screening? Yes, we have. Portable, uh, objectively measuring automated devices, which record either so-called automated transient evoked autoacoustic emissions, TEOREs, which assess the uh, function of the outer hair cells, the sensory cells of the inner ear. Or we have automated auditory brainstem response, which assesses the integrity of the auditory neural pathway up to the auditory brainstem. The screening can be formed easily between first and third day of life, also later, but in the first days it's very comfortable. Babies uh, lay and sleep or are, uh, are tired after breastfeeding or after feeding. And we use this, exploit this um, this time. Uh, an accurate diagnosis uh, with, uh, by perf uh, is performed by auditory brainstem response, ABR, or auditory steady state response testing, which tests again the integrity of the auditory neural pathway uh, to the auditory brainstem and to higher regions of the brain. And this confirms later objectively whether a hearing loss is there or not. But uh, ED, early hearing detection and intervention, goes far beyond uh, newborn hearing screening. High AD programs include the, the screening itself, but universal. 
ongoing surveillance for newborns who are at risk of hearing loss, but past the screening, we have several, several such babies. For example, if they have a con uh, congenital pseudomegalovirus infection, they uh, can get hearing loss a little bit later than newborn hearing screening and, and the next following years. A comprehensive audiological diagnostics to confirm and quantify the severity and type of uh, hearing loss. We call it follow-up, follow-up of newborn hearing screening. A medical referral for etiological intervention and manage, uh, investigation of causes and management. The provision with hearing aids, so important, we can do it from the first months of life on. With cochlear implants, we can do it from the sixth month of months of life on. Assistive listen, listening devices um, or hearing improving surgery, adjunctive counseling, information and training to support the technical, uh, the technical devices. What is so important is parental participation and family engagement. Uh, the parent training on beneficial communicative strategies is one of the most uh, one of the most powerful strategies for early rehabilitation. The social, psychological, and informational support for families of children with hearing loss, they really need this support. And the communication development options uh, to exploit them for the child, child, including oral oral rehabilitation, sometimes sign language is necessary to uh, to teach as well. The hearing screening must be accompanied by appropriate follow-up and interventions as the benefits of early detections are associated with early intervention rather than with the screening per se. Uh, the screening can be done uh, at universally or only at risk screening. Here you see a lot of risk factors for early hearing loss. However, you would miss around 40 to 50 uh, per percent of uh, infants who, uh, uh, no, uh, 50 to 60, because only 40 to 50 percent of babies show risk indicators. So a universal screening is the goal. And uh, in environments with no screening programs, an opportunistic screening, if parents are, uh, uh, suspect a hearing loss, could form a first step towards implementation of more effective programs, but this is not our goal. So very important, the cost effectiveness of the hearing screening has been demonstrated in various studies. Uh, also, you sh I show you some here, also in Germany, our own study, and WHO estimated in a lower middle income country, as Indonesia is one, a possible return of 1.667 international dollars for every one dollar invested in newborn hearing screening. In high income countries, it's even higher. So you get value for money. Um, there are two WHO resolutions which called uh, mem on member states to implement hearing screenings for infants, young children and older adults. Uh, the last one stemming from 2017 and they also called strongly to collect high quality population based data. Um, in response to this resolution, the WHO released the first World Report on Hearing in March 2021. And I tell you, it is a wonderful textbook about everything you want to know about hearing. I'm proud to be one of the authors. This World Report on Hearing defined uh, three tracer indicators for um, um, progress in ear and hearing care in each uh, um, population, in each nation, and uh, the hearing screening to successful is one of them. 
So the World Hearing Report also references a survey on the global status of newborn and infant hearing screening that provides the first global data-based information about the global status of newborn hearing screening programs. I have performed it with uh, 181 co-authors throughout the world. And you see, it was a questionnaire study. Uh, we got information from 158 countries. And what you see here, uh, during the reference period, it was uh, 10 years, 38% uh, of the world's population had no or minimal screening. These are the red ones. Minimal means below 1% of babies covered and Indonesia belongs to it. And 33% had fully or near fully implemented new universal programs of covering uh, of more than 85% of babies. So the average age at diagnosis of a hearing loss of screened babies was 4.6 months, that one of non-screened babies, uh, nearly 35 months. The average age at start of intervention of screened uh, uh, children was 6.9 months and that one of non-screened children 35 uh, months. So the hearing screening is associated with a lower average age at which a hearing loss is diagnosed and treated, namely at a time when the auditory pathway is well physiological accessible for a treatment. And this was the, the aim. The hearing screening is performed mostly in birthing facilities, less in outpatient clinics and homes. On average, 5% or 4.5% of babies uh, fail the screening, but they get full diagnostics then, and the failure rate is higher in, in countries where there is no high co coverage. And the mean loss to follow up rate of babies worldwide who failed the screenings but never are showed uh, to diagnostics and treatment is high, 17%. So, um, and there is a dearth of databases and regular data collection, which impacts the quality of many screening programs. Uh, this is associated with a dearth of tracking programs. A screening needs a tracking program. That means a tracking, there is a center for, for screenings and uh, a, a data collection, a server, and the people in the center, they see which babies need a screening and which got one, and uh, which babies failed the screening and have to go to a diagnostics. And you need to remind many parents to please come with your baby to a full diagnostics. Even in Germany, between 25 and 50% of parents did not show up uh, in a, for diagnostics and treatment uh, if they did not get a reminder uh, and phone calls from the screening centers. Without the tracking, the loss to follow up right is usually high or simply unknown. And it is much higher uh, in uh, countries with low uh, screening coverage. The um, prevalence we found was in median 1.7 per thousand infants, uh, and the findings is close to an international uh, uh, um, meta-analysis. The highest prevalence in countries with high parental consanguinity, where it uh, ranged up to 15 per thousand babies. Screening coverage is uh, highly related to the uh, uh, average living standard. The living standard in countries with full, near to full screening is on average 10 times higher than in countries with low screening coverage. You see it here on the left side. So my recommendations, a screening followed by early intervention has been shown to be effective, cost efficient and an excellent investment of resource. Requirements are that a government, either a, a, a federal or a 
uh, regional or uh, national should take on leadership responsibility regarding the strategic direction and implementation of the screening program in a health system. An adequate funding and resource, financial resource allocation for these programs, for example, in screening centers is needed. Government should enact a legislation for the screening programs. Uh, the screening programs should be monitored through national committees uh, on ear and hearing care, so recommendation of WHO guided by the Ministry of Health. Equal accessibility of screening and pediatric audiological follow-up diagnostics and services and rehabilitation programs are so necessary as the central point. Uh, affordable solutions for making hearing technology more widely available, including bulk purchases of hearing aids or implants is needed. Data collection and tracking systems should be established from the beginning of implementing of a newborn hearing screening program. Bidirectional data flow between decentralized screening devices and screening centers are necessary. Uh, Peter will talk about it. Use of telemedicine where connectivity uh, connectivity is available and the opportunity for case discussions with boards of experts. So we will have hopefully uh, um, discussion with our uh, uh, universities. Here I got the data for Indonesia. It was less than 1% of babies who had a screening according to the Ministry of Health and the Indonesian ORL societies. And here we started um, a program of early intervention uh, on uh, uh, and prevention of hearing loss in newborns and in, uh, uh, in Indonesia, including newborn hearing screening. And uh, Peter, Böttcher and I, we started a pilot project to, supported by Prof. Nilo Supunami whom I know from WHO in East Java province in August 23. We started with workshops for the colleagues and we attended conferences here, regional conferences. We visited the politicians here, uh, the, the province government of East Java, who agreed in uh, uh, implementing a universal newborn hearing screening uh, in uh, uh, East Java province. And uh, here is a letter of that I want to do it with my help. And uh, I have the offer of an adjunct professorship at the Erlanga University in uh, uh, Surabaya. And here is a preparation of a memorandum of agreement between uh, East Java province with the government of my federal state. They are, uh, uh, I had already a uh, talk with the Ministry of Economics and they are very much interested in this collaboration and probably also on the uh, um, national level we get such agreements. So what did I do? I traveled through the uh, through uh, East Java province, visited the ENT hospitals here and of course, we need also the access to academics, uh, Erlanga University, the resource centers which will perform the hearing screenings. And of course, I had to show by myself that I'm able to do it. And uh, I got support, very nice support, support by Professor Ismo Ismonanda, uh, the, um, uh, the representative of the UNESCO, of Indonesia in the UNESCO. And uh, visit and another um, meeting, and this is my nearly last slide, um, the PD, PGPKT, uh, where the Central Committee launched the prevention of hearing uh, loss in community health centers throughout Indonesia in September last year. And uh, this is the chair of it, Dr. Damayanti, you might know it. And here we had already a meeting uh, virtually with the Ministry of Health and some activities in the countries. I tr go through our concept. It's a very yeah, technical concept. And 
my last slide, uh, there are global and national targets uh, to fulfill by, uh, the, uh, by the WHO. And they say, WHO says, an effective coverage uh, where, where, where coverage of screening in countries is less than 50%, they should strive for a minimum of 50% coverage of hearing screening by 2030. And they will collect the data and ask also Indonesia for the data very soon. This is a big but solvable task. Let's start it within Indonesia. I'm glad to help. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Newman, for your enlightening uh, lectures. So we can see that uh, uh, Indonesia is still lacking for the hearing screening. And yet, thank you very much for already starting the uh, screening project from uh, begin from the Erlanga University. So we would like to discuss more, but uh, in the later after we will hear the next presentation from Mr. Peter Butcher. So, uh, hello, Mr. Hello, I can hello. hear you very well. Okay, I share you. the screen. Nice to see you, Mr. Peter. He is uh, the, the CEO of uh, Pet Medical. So, uh, please, Mr. Peter, without further ado, time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, first of all, I'm not the CEO of Pass Medical, even if I'm many years there. I'm more related to the, as a coordinator for the global screening and tracking affairs of Pass Medical. But let's go ahead. 15 minutes, I can give you just some flashlights for some important things related to newborn hearing screening. The first thing is, as we have seen uh, in the slides from the maturation of the auditory pathway structure, time is running. This is the only reason why we're doing a newborn hearing screening. The only reason, because we will detect all the babies with hearing loss, but often too late. So that's why we should be ready with our diagnosis within the first three months, time is always running. Here you see a small uh, picture of uh, uh, countries that we implemented screening and tracking already. Uh, screening is much, much more than a simple test on a baby. Yeah, often the focus is that, uh, oh, we need to implement, we need an instrument and we need to implement a test and conducting a test and everything is done. No, as we heard from Professor Neumann, that is only one wheel of a wheel work and the wheel work must be functioning. There's much more constituents in a, a well going and long-term sustainable newborn hearing screening system. What we see is we have mainly a newborn hearing screening in the hospitals. There's a large group of past babies who have usually no consequences. What we need to transfer that data to a central reporting site, or we call it a tracking center, for reasons of quality control and statistics. No one will invest money in a system which cannot give the evidence or the proof of a functioning uh, structure. But this is not our focus group. Our focus group is more these, the baby who failed their screening, the screening was not performed or incomplete. Those babies need to be brought to a follow-up or to a diagnostic center in a very short time. We have seen that the time is running for the baby. Now we have an effect that was already mentioned without a tracking. Worldwide, we see a roughly 50% loss to follow up rate. That means 50% will attend to the next step to the follow up, 50% will be lost. But if our targeted group can only bring us 50% benefit, then the screening makes no sense because from that moment on, we have to pay two funds. The one is for uh, 
establishing and, and conducting screening, universal screening, and the other is for the group of the non-detected babies. So the, the investment is much, much higher if you don't bring all the babies to a follow-up, and that's why we have a need for a tracking. Tracking is also a kind of task sharing because we need to talk with many institutions. We need to monitor processes. We have to have a, a very fast service structure and all these things. That's why tracking is a precondition for planning of a newborn hearing screening. And we implement a tracking center, which consists of tracking stuff and the software and the database. And the idea how the system is working or how the data is circulating is this. We have here the um, initial screening on the birth place, the demographic data plus an ID plus a test measurements will be transferred to the tracking center on a daily basis, even for subsequent data, all this should be transferred automatically, uh, avoiding many subsystems directly from the instrument to the tracking center. And based on this information, we give the recommendation to the parents, we contact them directly to say, hey, Parents, you know, you got information when discharging from hospital about the failed or not performed screening. So please come back in a very short time to catch up, uh, to repeat the screening. If the child attends to a follow-up site, even here, we have to do diagnosis or retests. That is time-consuming. And even the follow-up sites need to transfer the data to the tracking center so that all data is updated and actual at the tracking center and they know what is the next step if the child is still open or closed in order of tracking. This is a data flow, flow that must be implemented mm. and this is possible um, with modern uh, screening and diagnostic instruments. More or less the same structure. We have the screening on the one hand, then the tracking center who organizes and supervises and monitors the entire process. Sometimes we can establish low-level follow-up institutions in, in Indonesia, for example, resource centers, and we have a follow-up which is a qualified pediatric audiological diagnosis. What are the duties and the, the procedures here we have to do in the maternity hospitals or similar places? The first or initial screening before discharging from hospital, that would be ideal, but later than 24 hours, we performing usually OIE test and if necessary, ABR test, except of the risk babies, the high risk babies have to have the ABR or the AABR, that means the automated ABR screening tests. And simply we have a pass refer or an incomplete result at the end of this. Then it becomes more critical because if mothers are discharged from hospital, we facing a lot of problems because we don't know what the decision is from the parents to bring the baby back or not. Uh, the parents can come in the maternities or to some um, uh, similar structures to have a rescreening, ideal within 14 days of life, because the older the child is getting, the more difficult is it to have a colon baby and to apply a test. And here we see more or less the same structure, a repeated screening, maybe with otoscopy as a additional or a tympanometry method. And uh, on that level, which is ideal, local, in the near of the home place of the mother, uh, we can do, we can exclude a hearing loss maximum, or we can, um, can uh, forward the baby to a diagnosis. This is the end of the local screening. Most often the experts and the diagnostic centers are in the capital or in bigger cities. Here we have to do the follow-up on both ears in a very short time 
And we have to apply all types of measurements for diagnosis that causes often two to three appointments. That's why the time is running even here and we have a strict time limit. The earlier, the better. That's the main message. Um, all this will be organized and monitored by the so-called tracking center. Um, they, um, we are of monitoring the, the whole process that no time delay is, um, uh, we suffer, we don't know suffer from any time delay. So what is the sequence of the um, events? Here we need to inform the parents and best by, by posters, by flyers, so that the mothers are informed what is newborn hearing screening and what is the necessity. The screening on both ears with a screening ID, otherwise you cannot run such a huge system. Um, if we fail the OIE, then we have to apply directly an ABR measurement uh, and the results, uh, if we have a refer result, then the mother must be informed, what is my next step? What, where, who can I, who can I call? What is the follow up site address? And what time I have to perform the re-screening. Similar here, re-screening on both ears, time is always uh, um, um, from a high importance. And here we should not uh, hold the babies for a long time. If we cannot get a pass on that structure, we should forward directly to a diagnosis. Uh, even here, we should have a consented uh, protocol or uh, uh, contract with the follow-up sites that they're offering in a short time appointments. Uh, the follow-up, again, is also in a time pressure uh, in the interest of their baby's diagnostic age. Good. These are some data who need to be transmitted uh, semi-automatically. Some instruments do you can do this. We have uh, permissions and login data for nurses, for physicians, audiologists, whoever is doing the screening with several profiles. We transfer the personal data and the screening ID of the baby and measurements, not only, um, not only results. In the case that we have a failed or not uh, successful screening, we need the address of the parents, the caregiver, and again, we transferring measurements instead of results, because here I can see what the examiner is seeing on his instrument screen. He can, I can assess in the tracking center the quality of the test, the environmental conditions, and so on. And not only screening tests, we can also do diagnostic tests and send them from the instrument. Just um, not an advertise, it's just to, to, to tell you what is possible meanwhile. For example, we implemented this new Q-screen instrument in uh, entire Uzbekistan and they don't enter personal data anymore. Yeah? They have, they give out from the hospital system the name and demographic data, a screening ID in a QR code. We have implemented a camera and we can directly uh, um, insert by one click um, our personal data, which is often time consuming, one minute just for typing in all the information. We have another thing that is really a game changer, really a game changer is um, a noise canceling pro. Yeah, what you can see, we suffer often from environmental noise, especially in the birth hospitals, and this prevents that we can record a good OIE signal. Uh, here we have implemented a second microphone. We implemented a noise cancellation so that we can have um, a strong OIE response and a very filtered, low filtered um, uh, uh, environmental noise. This brings us, maybe we have time later, I can show you results from countries like Benin, which is incredibly good. Um, uh, and this, we see the effect of such noise cancelling. We have other instruments that integrate all the diagnostic types in addition to all the screening types for sure, uh, so that we can <clears throat> directly transfer not only the measurements, we can also transmit the follow-up 
diagnosis, uh, appointment management direct from the instrument. You don't need to send extra letters or something like this. And we can transfer diagnosis by entering a diagnostic code. So easy uh, and time saving can it be? And um, does this really um, a, a change, let's say, from the screening, what we did 20 years ago? The program sustainability, yes, we have more or less three, three tasks always. We have to reduce the time for our, the time investment in our screening on all places. The, um, we have to reduce the expenses for sure. And the effort in general is also to be reduced. And this is only possible by a highest uniformity, as Professor Neumann mentioned, yeah, as uniform as, as possible, universal and uniform. By task sharing, the idea of task sharing is not uh, just a verbal uh, sentence. No, no, no. Task sharing means we should not hold babies on the wrong place. We should forward them. We should consider this as a teamwork. We are a team. Otherwise, it will never work. And quality control is not to blame someone or something, but we need to keep the level of quality in our screening program. Otherwise, it goes wrong more and more and we facing a lot of problems. Um, this is by my experience of 20 years in that field uh, quite clear. Yeah, thank you very much. I tried to, uh, to outline some highlights. Uh, let's say if I have a final sentence, time for the final sentence. For my experience, the most um, mistakes by, by organizing such a screening program were made in the phase of planning. We need a very good planning uh, for implementing such a big structure. Otherwise, we cannot turn the game or the wheel later on uh, the, we have only possibilities for slight corrections. That's why I can recommend, because I often have seen that an insufficient planning causes a lot of issues later on in the screening program. And we have, should invest our money just one time, one time uh, and not five times in a row. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Mrs. Peter, for the uh, presentation. It's quite uh, enlightening for all of us. So we can hear, we can see here all most of the participants came also from the health authority in the locals, in the province, in the districts and regencies. So we hope that uh, by after listening to your presentation and then hearing further from the discussion with the expert panel. So in the letter, what you expect that uh, a good planning for uh, implementing a nationwide hearing screening can be uh, established. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Peter Pocher. So uh, without uh, further delay, we will invite the last uh, presentation from the last speaker, last but not the least. So we would like to introduce uh, the Excellency Professor Dr. Neil Pony, otolaryngologist, FX, FCM. Uh, she is a distinguished professor in the neurotology in the Erlanga University. Uh, she was graduated full from Erlanga University and got uh, professors in the uh, in the in the field of the, the hearing problem and deafness and. I believe that uh, uh, her uh, speeches about uh, the the efforts to reduce the numbers of the uh, human problems and the deafness in Indonesia by building resources <laughs> will be very interesting. So without further ado, we will invite Professor Nilo. How are you, Professor Nilo? Can you hear my voice? Fine. Hello. Hello. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya. Suara saya terdengar, Prof. Jelas, jelas. Ya. 
Yeah. Terima kasih Prof Nila. Mohon maaf sebelum Prof Nila mohon izin saya sampaikan kepada para para panelis, para penonton sekalian apabila ada pertanyaan silakan ditulis di chat. Tidak perlu khawatir bisa ditulis bahasa Indonesia atau bahasa Inggris nanti yeah. insya akan saya terjemahkan untuk kepada para yeah. panelis. Silakan Prof Nila yeah. dan tempat kami silakan. Yeah. Terima kasih. Jin untuk sharing ya. Share share screen. Ya. Sudah terlihat ya. Ya, sudah terlihat, Prof. Silakan. Ya, terima kasih. Izin mungkin saya pakai bahasa Indonesia tapi slide in English ya. Ini supaya lebih jelas ya. Ya, silakan, Prof. Ya, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, saya akan menyampaikan topik tentang implementasi uh, universal newborn hearing screening di Indonesia uh, dengan harapan apakah bisa untuk uh, menjadi realitas. Uh, kami dari uh, Provinsi Jawa Timur telah melakukan beberapa kegiatan yang berkaitan dengan uh, newborn hearing screening, yaitu uh, mau maju ya ya oke okay. nah, seperti tadi sudah disampaikan uh, Prof Catherine bahwa uh, dalam kejadian tuli kongenita di mana sudah terjadi gangguan pendengaran sejak kelahiran atau sejak dalam kandungan sehingga lahir uh, sudah terjadi ketulian dan ini adalah masa yang sangat sensitif dan biasanya terjadi pada derajat berat sampai sangat berat sehingga berpengaruh pada perkembangan selanjutnya bila tidak dilakukan penanganan dengan baik. Dan kita sebut sebagai ini sesuatu masalah yang urgent, ya, masalah yang kritis dan kita tidak bisa menunggu waktu yang beberapa lama lagi untuk segera melakukan suatu tindakan yang seharusnya dilakukan. Tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Prof. Catherine, yaitu ada window period yang sangat sempit ya berkaitan dengan fase maturasi dari saraf dan otak kita di mana uh, menjadi uh, masa yang sangat menentukan pada usia satu tahun. Selama satu tahun eh, pertama Dan perkembangan ini akan terus langsung menjadi Dalam dua tahun itu sangat menentukan Seperti kita ketahui adalah fungsi pendengaran kita eh, Sangat pesat dalam perkembangannya Mencapai puncak pada usia 3-6 bulan dan dilanjutkan oleh perkembangan bicara dan bahasa pada usia 8-9 bulan sehingga bisa disebut sebagai periode yang sensitif. Nah, bila tidak dilakukan penanganan yang tepat, maka hasilnya dalam intervensi nanti akan tidak bisa maksimal. Untuk prevalensi tadi sudah disebutkan bahwa eh, di rumah sakit Dr. Sutomo kita mendapatkan kasus sekitar 177 bayi ya di mana eh, yang berisiko itu maka kita setelah lakukan pemeriksaan ada gangguan pendengaran secara unilateral atau satu sisi sekitar 16% dan yang bilateral adalah 14%. Sebagai penyebab eh, bahwa eh, gangguan pendengaran itu bisa terjadi pada setiap usia Nah, khususnya pada tuli kongenital ini berpengaruh yaitu pada masa perinatal, perinatal, dan postnatal. Nah, pada perinatal itu biasanya terjadi gangguan di mana ada faktor risiko tadi yang sudah dijelaskan oleh Prof. Catherine, ya, antara asfiksia, hiperbilirubinemia, low birth rate, ya, kemudian morbiditas yang lainnya. Sedangkan pada saat dalam kandungan, pengaruh genetik ini sangat besar. Ya, bisa antara 60 sampai 70 persen dan infeksi pada saat eh, kehamilan seperti rubella dan CMV. Syukurnya di Indonesia telah eh, dilakukan imunisasi nasional yaitu MR, yaitu misos dan rubella 
dan sampai saat ini sudah berjalan untuk surveillance congenital rubella syndrome di mana rumah sakit Dr. Sutomo sebagai rumah sakit sentinel. Jadi kami melakukan juga untuk pelacakan gangguan pendengaran yang berkaitan dengan infeksi virus rubella. Dampak dari gangguan pendengaran tersebut, kita tahu bahwa sangat signifikan berpengaruh pada gangguan perkembangan bicara dan bahasa kognitif, kemudian isolasi sosial, stigma ada di masyarakat, kemudian dampak pada ekonomi, ya, kemudian juga pencapaian prestasi akademis, dan juga nanti eh, dalam untuk mencari pekerjaannya. Sehingga berpengaruh pada berbagai aspek dalam kehidupan yang kalau diukur itu yaitu antara lain yaitu years live with disability dan disability adjusted life years. Nah di sini eh, permasalahan di eh, negara berkembang yaitu eh, anak yang mengalami gangguan pendengaran pada saat yang e, dulu ya sebelumnya itu sangat sulit untuk mendapatkan sekolah dan e, bahkan banyak mereka yang tidak sekolah tidak tidak mengenyam pendidikan dan e, orang tua tetap e, mengasuh anak-anak ini e, di dalam rumah dan tidak pernah keluar dan sebagainya ya berkaitan dengan stigma di antara lain kemudian untuk mendapatkan pekerjaan juga bersaing dengan orang yang normal tentunya akan sangat sulit ya dan e, dengan e, pencapaian prestasi akademis kemudian kualitasnya dianggap e, kurang ya daripada orang yang normal. Nah ternyata e, untuk prevensinya pencegahan ini bisa 60 persen ternyata bisa dilakukan di primary healthcare. Jadi untuk ini potensial untuk kita melakukan sesuatu yang bisa untuk mencegah gangguan pendengaran tersebut. Nah, ini permasalahannya untuk preventionnya, habilitasi, kemudian deteksi dininya, edukasi dininya, dan sebagainya. Ternyata untuk PAUD pun itu belum ada untuk anak yang kebutuhan khusus, padahal mereka kalau uh, dengan uh, early deteksi dan intervensi itu adalah usia satu bulan dilakukan screening ya dalam satu bulan pertama dua hari paling awal kemudian tiga bulan diagnostik enam bulan sudah diintervensi maka setelah itu perlu dilakukan e, semacam terapi kemudian dia mengikuti pendidikan usia dini nah ini menjadi kekurangan kita kemudian e, juga hearing aid dan cochlear implant yang masih belum di cover oleh pemerintah ya. untuk itu kita mulai untuk uh, melakukan screening pendengaran ini untuk mendeteksi secara awal dan uh, melakukan intervensi sehingga harapannya mereka akan menjadi anak yang uh, seperti perkembangan seperti anak yang normal yang lainnya sehingga memberikan hak mereka untuk mendengar walaupun dia mengalami ketulian dan juga untuk pencapaian prestasi di kemudian hari. Nah, ini adalah programnya 1, 3, dan 6. Ya, untuk itu maka dilakukan uh, pemeriksaan dengan UAE, dengan APR Dan permasalahan alat ini adalah masih belum tersedia di layanan primer Sehingga kita sering melakukan cara yang sederhana Yang dikatakan tadi adalah 50-60% itu adalah uh, mengalami ya, kesulitan untuk mendapatkan uh, hasil yang sebenarnya Nah, untuk itu maka ada suatu konsep di mana screening harus ditingkatkan dengan memperbaiki e, peralatan, bukan hanya SDM-nya saja, kemudian e, perlu ada dukungan dari policy maker, dari e, Pemda, dan e, dari pemerintah e, pusat, ya. kemudian e, juga untuk meningkatkan e, kesadaran masyarakat. Untuk Alur screening ini kita sudah mempunyai uh, pedoman di mana uh, pernah dilakukan beberapa kali rapat yaitu Health Technology Assessment tahun 2010 ya tapi uh, sampai sekarang masih belum menjadi suatu uh, compulsory ya keharusan untuk melakukan. Nah, kita sudah melihat tadi slide-nya Prof. Catherine bahwa Indonesia menjadi prioritas ya untuk uh, dilakukan program ini karena 
masih belum dilaksanakan sampai sekarang yaitu oh, uh, screeningnya masih bersifat targeted yaitu dilakukan pada yang uh, ber, uh, berisiko tinggi saja bukan pada universal atau pada semua bayi baru lahir sehingga kesempatan untuk lolos uh, dari follow up itu uh, sangat besar ya ini uh, yang kita lakukan biasanya behavioral hanya melihat saja ya dari perubahan sikap dan sebagainya terhadap suara tersebut sedangkan gold standarnya adalah UAE dan EBR yang mudah untuk dilakukan Ini adalah salah satunya Birafun, kemudian UAE, dan ada berbagai macam eh, peralatan yang lainnya yang eh, makin canggih yang nantinya akan bisa dilakukan eh, semacam tracking ya dan mengirim data dengan cepat sekali eh, sehingga akan bisa di follow up ya, seperti disampaikan pada pembicara sebelumnya. Nah untuk itu maka eh, di sini eh, Komite Daerah Penanggulan Gangguan Pendengaran dan Ketulian mempunyai program selain tuli kongenital, OMSK, GPAP, gangguan pendengaran akibat bising, serumen, tutok, dan presbiskusis. Untuk itu strategi pencegahan layanan primer yaitu melalui puskesmas dengan deteksi dini, rujukan follow up, posyandu dengan edukasinya, dan screen sederhana. Kemudian kami mempunyai resource center untuk edukasi dan deteksi dini dan follow up. dan juga untuk pendampingan sekolah. Ini yang sudah disampaikan tadi. Semakin banyak faktor risiko, maka akan kemungkinan uh, terjadi ketulian yang makin tinggi. Dan ini adalah uh, resource center kita. Ada lima resource center yang sudah mempunyai pusat pendengaran dan komunikasi dan siap untuk pendampingan sampai uh, anak-anak tersebut mendapatkan pendidikan uh, yang sesuai ya untuk mencapai Uh, tujuan yaitu yang ingin kita capai yaitu bright future for the deaf baby. Nah, ini adalah uh, kegiatan mereka yaitu juga melakukan pemeriksaan, kemudian uh, di mana memberikan suatu kemudahan akses yaitu dengan follow up, ya kemudian rehabilitasi, kemudian intervensi dan kembali lagi untuk uh, persiapan untuk pendidikannya. Saya kira untuk uh, ringkasannya yaitu permasalahannya adalah tuli kongenital ini adalah sesuatu masalah yang harus segera diatasi, tidak bisa menunggu lama dan mempunyai dampak yang signifikan bila ditangani dengan yang dengan baik. Kemudian solusinya adalah dengan newborn hearing screening yang bersifat universal sehingga kita tidak uh, lewat yang tadi faktor-faktor yang lainnya yang bisa berpengaruh dalam uh, deteksinya. Kemudian menggunakan alat yang school standar yaitu OAI dan EPR. Kemudian dilanjutkan uh, follow up dan referral bila ada gangguan maka uh, dilakukan diagnostik dan dilanjutkan dengan intervensi. Untuk pencegahan itu adalah kita perlu melakukan suatu kegiatan yang uh, bersifat uh, pelatihan misalnya di primary care sehingga untuk melakukan uh, pemeriksaan yang sesuai yang dengan baik dan uh, bisa dikerjakan di uh, primary care atau puskesmas. Lakukan imunisasi, antenatal care, kemudian edukasi, deteksi dini ya. Dan e, dari pemerintah maka perlu ada komitmen, ada dukungan untuk pelaksanaan kegiatan ini sehingga bisa dicapai untuk screening pendengaran maupun e, nanti e, intervensinya e, membutuhkan e, beberapa alat dan sebagainya, metode nah itu sesuai dengan keputusan dari orang tua yaitu family planning mereka memilih komunikasi yang seperti apa. Ya, ringkasannya adalah tuli kongenital dapat dicegah. Untuk itu maka perlu ada uh, suatu program yang harus dilaksanakan adalah deteksi intervensi dini dan peran dari puskesmas di garda terdepan ini sangat penting. Untuk itu diharapkan bisa uh, diimplementasikan universal newborn hearing screening dan uh, menjadikan suatu prioritas ya masalah ini di masyarakat dan untuk itu kita harapkan menuju sound hearing 2030 yang 6 tahun lagi yang akan kita capai maka kita perlu ada peningkatan aksi untuk itu mencapai bright future for the deaf people.
Demikian yang bisa saya sampaikan bahwa hari pendengarannya sudah sekian lamanya sejak tahun 2015 sudah kita eh, rayakan atau kita peringati dan eh, sampai sekarang dan eh, mempunyai suatu tema yang khusus untuk itu maka eh, kita bisa angkat ya di sini. Terima kasih atas perhatiannya. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, terima kasih Prof. Nyilo untuk presentasinya. Eh, saya kira baik sekali rekan-rekan sekalian. Jadi apa yang disampaikan Prof. Nyilo itu juga menjadi terjemahan dari apa yang disampaikan Prof. Catherine. Jadi kami harapkan teman-teman yang ada di online juga lebih bisa memahami. Oke, okay. thank you very much, um, Professor Catherine, uh, Mr. Peter Pochler, and Prof. Nilo for the presentations. So before we start our discussion today, we would like to uh, invite two discussants to give their comments about uh, the three presentations. But well, first, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Adeline Eva, otolaryngologist and head and neck surgery, which is now uh, uh, performing clinical practice in Paris Apri Harapan Kita. Dr. Adeline, can you hear my voice? Bisa mendengar suara saya? Ah, oh, kita tidak bisa mendengar suara Dr. Adeline. Halo? Belum terdengar Dr. Adeline? Mungkin mic-nya anu. Masih di mute? Masih di mute sebenarnya Dr. Adeline? Mic-nya dibuka, Dok. Dari anunya, dari RSA pengharapan kita, mic-nya belum tersambung, apa sudah tersambung? Ya. Yeah. So, I think it will be very interesting after listening to the presentation from the expert. Now, we will hear some point of view from the clinician, actually. How we can establish the... Uh, uh, hearing screening in the later and how we can perform like a multidisciplinary teamwork, right? So we will looking forward to hear from Dr. Adeline or maybe while waiting Dr. Adeline for uh, uh, fixing the audio problem. Uh, saya mau izin ya Dr. Adeline, mungkin kita ke Dr. Asadi dulu ya sambil mendengar anu menunggu Dr. Adeline uh, memperbaiki mic-nya atau sudah bisa? Halo? Atau dokter itu? Ya? Oke, kita tunggu sebentar. Ya, sambil menunggu Bapak-Ibu, kami uh, ingatkan sekali lagi, uh, silakan apapun Bapak-Ibu nanti ingin mengajukan pertanyaan, bisa menulis di chat, atau kalau ingin bertanya secara langsung, boleh raise hand. Uh, link absen sudah di-share di chat, apabila Bapak-Ibu memang berkenan untuk mengisi. Oke, okay, bagaimana? Oke, okay, ya, yeah. kita sudah bisa mendengar suara dari RSA harapan kita. Okay, Dr. Adeline, please. Yeah. I'm so sorry for uh, the audiologic problem. Thank yes. you, moderator Dr. Dian Kesuma Pramudia. First of all, I would like to uh, raise a highly appreciation and gratitude that we from Nation, uh, Harapan Kita National Women and Children uh, Health Center are allowed to join this webinar with an outstanding presentation by Professor Katrin Newman from University uh, Clinic of Munster, Germany, and from Mr. Peter Butcher, CEO Path Medical, and from Professor Nilo Purnami from University of uh, Erlanga University. I have recorded some, uh, there is several number of challenges, I think, that are still faced regarding these uh, screening uh, our early hearing detection. First, lack of prevalence data. The national prevalence of hearing loss is 2.6%. And the highest number is from East 
Nusa Tenggara, and the lowest is from Banten Province. But this data is from the year of 2013 from Basic Health Research or Reset Kesehatan Dasar. So it's a, it has been 10 years ago. And the second uh, issue, I think, is uh, ec economic issue. The cost of hearing screening programs that can be influenced or uh, related to equipment equipment needed for screening are uh, consumable related to the screening and salary to pay the technician or healthcare workers and administrative uh, tasks or hardware database consume or uh, financial problems, I think. The third issue is uh, ethical issue. The respect for the parents, uh, protecting privacy, of the patients and of course justice for all people involved in uh, these programs the late um, the other issue uh, i think we should erase for the uh, hearing screening is lack of uh, infrastructure the secure transportation to the public uh, health service as we know that indonesia comprised from uh, 17,500 islands spread to the equator. So uh, I think the transportation is uh, also the major problem to address this uh, program. Uh, the next uh, issue I think is uh, lack of health healthcare workers specialization or training. Uh, to perform this procedure in uh, their institution. And another is patient issue. Uh, as I said, the traveling costs still a major issue to our patient, especially in Indonesia. And lo loss of daily income when they come to health service center or, hosp or hospital and it is sometimes difficult to uh, track or uh, the address to track the uh, the address i mean and calling back uh, with phone number they provided and of course the last but not least is government support uh, as dr eva susanti said uh, earlier in introduction that uh, hearing is not a government priority yet so addressing uh, those issues, I think there are uh, various elements uh, of an effective and efficient newborn hearing screen programs uh, we uh, were identified. How to increase heightened public awareness through systematic provision of essential information to the parents, to the health workers, uh, to the policymakers, educators, or other stakeholders on the importance of the hearing and the consequences of failure to detect hearing impairment early and benefit of uh, early detection and intervention. Uh, the second, I think we need a clear operational guidelines and assignment of roles and responsibilities. So, uh, each of institution and the personnel involved know exactly what to do, how to do. And the third is, uh, like Mr. Peter Bush said, that uh, setting up a system of tracking and how to follow up, uh, covering the various stages of the program is uh, as well as services uh, should be family oriented and complemented by active parents. And of course, uh, quality control and assurance benchmark uh, is uh, really, really need to, to perform this program uh, succeeded globally. He, we in uh, Harapan Kita National Women and uh, Children Health Center started 
to perform these hearing programs and uh, even in a national university we just reach seven percent to detect to to examine the newborn baby below to 28 days and the infant below six months we reach 30 38 percent and for the infant before one year we just reach 49 percent so it is a difficult difficult program uh, and i think if we all uh, work together as prof milo said that uh, we can proceed to this early hearing detection and uh, intervention i think uh, this is it from me dr dian thank you little bit uh, giving uh, emphasis in Dr. Adeline comments. So ladies and gentlemen, so actually Dr. Adeline emphasized many challenges in the uh, establishing an efficient uh, hearing screening actually, until even though the governmental support, economic transportation problem, there are <coughs> issues that may hinder the efficient hearing screening. So uh, the, the lack of the preference data, and also there is an absence of the clinical guidelines, which that is which why in, in, the, in the first beginning of our webinar, Professor Laksono also emphasized the necessity to perform like a small task force that will make the follow up to enable uh, us here, maybe the team to in, in the future to, to, uh, to promote an, uh, a, a supporting policy in the later. So thank you very much, Dr. Adeline, uh, for the comments. So the second comments, uh, we uh, in front here on my side is Dr. Ashedi Prastio. He is an otolaryngologist and head and neck surgery from Universitas Gajah Mada and Sarjuta General Hospital. Dr. Ashedi, time is yours. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the old speaker. First of all, that's uh, enlightening, very, very enlightening uh, lecture from Professor Newman. Uh, both uh, Mr. Bocher and Professor Nilo. Maybe we have a same uh, face a same problem in uh, uh, like in Harapan Kita. We all know we we must uh, implement or, or promoting hearing program to screen all babies in uh, less than one month and carry out intervention starting of age of six months but the problem in here in especially in Sarjit hospital uh, there is a limitation to do the universal hearing screening uh, we don't have any universal hearing screening program in indonesia especially so we do the targeted only targeted hearing screening or uh, baby or baby with high risk uh, that we can screen, uh, such as prematurity, low birth weight, and baby history with asphyxia, and etc. So we go to the neonatal intensive care unit, and we collaborate with the uh, children's uh, department to our pediatric department to to screen uh, baby high risk. Uh, in our hospital, there is the first problem. Maybe it's the same in all in Indonesia. We have, we don't have uh, any universal universal hearing screening pro program. And and the second is yes, there is a limitation of available equipment, but in our Sarjito we have only two. Uh, equipment or uh, auto acoustic emission yeah and but we don't have automatic apr uh, we have a diagnostic apr but we don't have uh, 
automated ABR. It may be best before we dive into the universal screening to make sure that at least all hospital in Indonesia have access to the screening devices. That uh, after that we can then expand to the primary healthcare or puskesmas, yeah, to training and uh, maybe from the primary healthcare uh, auto acoustic emission or screening with OAA maybe is relatively easy to perform, but maybe uh, automatic APR we can uh, train them before the use of the that device. And uh, the last one maybe in our problem in our hospital is regarding implementation of universal heating sc screening or targeted heating screening is that how the service would be financed. Maybe we can next collaborate with the Indonesian Universal Health Coverage or PPGS to finance this, this program if we have universal heating screening program. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dian. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asadi. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to uh, and, uh, make uh, emphasize for Dr. Asadi comments. Actually, the uh, adding additional information from Dr. Adeline. So, Dr. Asadi also have an experience for performing the hearing screening program. However, most of them are conducted by indication, by medical indication. It's just only for the high risk infant uh, in collaboration with pediatric department. So we do not have any universal hearing screening program in Jakarta for for while like this. So, and on the other hand, we also have limited availability in the equipment as we do not have any automatic uh, APR uh, machines. So for the solution, maybe in the future, there is uh, indeed uh, there is a necessity to perform collaboration with the. Uh, National Health Insurance Company, which is PPGS, right, to uh, to support the establishment of the universal hearing screening. So thank you, Dr. Asadi, for the comments. So um, actually, we already have uh, several questions uh, in the chat room. So before we go to the chat room for the answer to the discussion, is there any comments or feedback from Professor Newman regarding both comments from the clinicians, from Dr. Ahasad or Dr. Adeline. Please, Professor Catherine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes, I'm very eager to answer uh, some of your uh, comments. So I, I, I feel so uh, connected to you because I was in the same situation when I started implementing newborn hearing screening in Germany. We started with my federal state and I started with one doctoral student, then it were four and so on. And in the beginning, I had two main impressions. The first one was, it's too much too much work, too much difficulties, um, uh, too much money needed. The devices uh, were my, my most problem. I tell you, this will all disappear. This will all disappear and can be overcome. And the device will become your last problem. And we have um, a nice saying at WHO, if you have a big task in front of you and you are uh, looking a donkey at first to do it, be the donkey by yourself at first. So <laughs> start with something. Um, I often hear the, uh, the, the, let's start with the ethical issue with protecting privacy of parents. There are studies, I collected the studies, where parents of uh, hearing impaired children retrospectively evaluate their access to uh, yeah, newborn hearing screening, getting the diagnosis, having a, a hearing impaired child. And they felt this time where they, they were unsecure about what is with my baby? Does, it, does she or he has a hearing loss? And getting the diagnosis was the most 
stressful time for them, the most shocking and so on. And there we need the parental support. But afterwards, retrospectively, they said all in study from Poland and from United States and so also in Germany, um, we are we were so grateful to learn very early what happened to our child so that we could react. But I, I guess it's not a big uh, issue. The next one, we did, um, we run um, um, a cost benefit analysis. And we also were reluctant with disposables. You can reduce disposables in a way maybe Peter Böttcher will, will answer to this and uh, also uh, uh, yeah, clean something uh, of it so and, and use it twice, of course, not the, the electrodes um, of the AABR. Yeah, and um, as uh, um, Dr. Asadi said, um, you often do the ABR, the full diagnostic ABR, and I, I know many, and uh, this was also the, the answer which I get from Ronnie Sovento, that instead of screening, often if a screening is needed, full diagnostic ABR are done or full diagnostic TEOE, but then you lose so much time. You lose so much time, and this makes it much more expensive, your screening, then having once invested in a in an equipment, and then um, uh, yeah, have many measurements per hour, so to say. Um, the uh, uh, the seventeen thousand um, islands. Okay of Indonesia. <laughs> I was involved in the implementation of newborn hearing screening in the Philippines. They have also a lot of, a lot of islands. And this is uh, what um, Dr. Adeline said. Um, so she and, and you also uh, talked about the operational guidelines, um, the definition of roles. This is so important. And we wrote at WHO two brochures. The one is manual for implementing such a screening. And the other one is situation analysis tool. So you really need uh, SOP, standard operational procedures. And this makes it much easier. And Peter will surely talk about um, the, the advantage to link one screening center with all the decentralized screening devices which are in the in the hospitals and so even for repair you need not to travel forward and backward i i i leave this to peter but you can do it all uh, um, via telecommunication uh, even a repair and the, the same is the case for traveling so you need not, and, and honestly, this is our first step in uh, East Java that we want to start the screening with staff from the resource centers who have to, who has to travel through the birth facilities. However, this will not be the solution for all the future because you need to be there where the baby is. Therefore, we trained all the nurses or midwives in the hospitals and the birth clinics to do the screenings because they know best. They know best when the baby sleeps, uh, when you have a little bit free time. And yeah, uh, this is so important. Uh, who finances the program? It is not that expensive. So if the government, oh, takes over responsibility for developing their young people, giving them all the same cha chances, making uh, uh, the, uh, the devices accessible uh, to all children. So I already learned that there are two branches in the hospitals, one for persons who pay privately for better hearing aids, and maybe for cochlear implants and one who have the governmental rather cheap health insurance. This is not what 
WHO means with equal accessibility to the services. And from my side, I can say what is mostly lacking is also the knowledge, the pediatric audiological knowledge. In Germany, we have a second specialization. In my first five years lasting uh, specialization, I'm an otorhinolaryngologist. In my second five years lasting specialization, I'm a pediatric audiologist and phoniatrician, which is a specialization for, uh, for doctors in Germany. And I will invite people, young doctors from Indonesia, <clears throat> to come to my department and get taught about uh, the necessities, or I will travel, my, my staff will travel to help you in getting the knowledge. Maybe I stop here. I have still so many points, but I do not want to, to disturb Peter or Prof. Nilo from answering. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Newman. So actually, we are uh, we are waiting after this for your next uh, answer. So uh, we have to move on to the Mr. Pocher, so Mr. Peter Pocher. Is there any uh, additional comments regarding uh, the comments from Dr. Asadi and Dr. Italy? Please. I, I try not to repeat the same, but <laughs> of course, it's pioneer work. Mm. Yeah. And uh, you need to think about yourself when you want to start with this. You can wait another 10 years hmm, without anything, but you can do it maybe now. And again, yes, uh, it's pioneer work. You need to do something, but you have a lot of support, I guess, from the industry, from other countries, from well-running projects. And I would take the opportunity, honestly, uh, if you are such a high, a huge group as you are, as, as I can see here in the webinar. Uh, to, um, two recommendations, definitely start with a pilot project because all the things I heard, um, I summarize this a little bit, yeah, is, as Professor Neumann mentioned, the same thing like 20, 30 years. The UK started in the same way. Oh, how can we do this? Uh, Germany, all the uh, uh, countries had this face had faced the same issues. So, and again, from my perspective, after implementing screening programs in many countries, is implementing screen sounds maybe uh, strong, but uh, in, uh, implementing screening is easy. Let's say eighty percent screening coverage rate easy implementing follow-up structure much more difficult uh, so uh, uh, um, finally you can do the same uh, thoroughly training for everyone uh, but the outcome can be very difficult uh, very different because leadership leadership is also a very important point if the leaders um, are not going in the same direction if they cannot motivate so then uh, the parents will read this as an answer or the let's say the examiners will not do the job properly and so on um, if i have two minutes i can show you data um, that may um that may given evidence of what I'm talking about. Look here, for example, I have in several countries this implemented the same system, 100% the same, two days training, very well organized, same equipment, same examiners, same hospitals in African countries. What we can see here is the birth rate of these uh, um, all the hospitals, and this is the babies who have been transmitted. This is a very ideal um, outcome. You see in the first month there was a learning curve and later on also uh, 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 mothers from other hospitals showed up. So this can happen. If you compare it with other countries, the same structure, look at this. Yeah? You see um, there's a huge difference in the transmitting performance yeah, or in the coverage rate, uh, even if we have the same things implemented and we learned some things, ah, uh, we need more time to improve our screening. No, this was not true. 
the time plays not a role. Or this is caused by the numbers of births. Yeah, We have much more uh, children than others and so on. All these arguments are not true. This is how to plan, how to organize projects. This would be the ideal screening, yeah? 95% passing the primary screening, 4% maximum failed. The reality, for example, in two years of one of the countries, yeah, 10% fails. Um, and in the year after, 5.5% fails after primary screening. Let's say, what I want to say is the countries facing always the same problems. And um, uh, let's say here, for example, the outcome of Mali yeah, in the black and white outcome, yeah, they improved a little bit, a little bit. So, and then they had a quite a good outcome of failed compared to past, then it would be uh, a lower outcome. Uh, what I want to show is, look here, everything is possible, even the ideal, the ideal approach yeah, of nearly no fails after primary screen. Everything is possible, but it is related, again, on a good planning, on your leadership and your engagement in the things. And the rest is possible. Believe it. Yes, oh, very, thank you very much, Mr. Peter. So, yes, you em emphasize the necessity for start from the pilot project, start small, getting fast, yeah. getting big, yes, yeah. right? Definitely. So, and then, yes, uh, we agree with you that follow up is the most difficult one. Yeah, we could, making like a sporadic screening may be easier, but uh, okay, having follow up after that, then uh, the policy is quite difficult. So thank you, Mr. Peter and uh, Professor Newman. So is there any additional comments from uh, Professor Newman? Please, Prof. Terima kasih. Mungkin saya uh, perlu memberikan semacam penekanan dan lebih menjelaskan ya, karena dengan bahasa Indonesia, uh, semoga lebih mudah dimengerti uh, bahwa intinya di sini uh, kita mengharapkan peran dari pemerintah bahwa uh, pendengaran ini perlu diprioritaskan. Ya. Kalau kita melihat SDGs, SDGs itu tidak ada pendengaran itu. Jadi masuknya kalau kita publikasi itu ke quality of life atau well-being atau mana ya. Sehingga eh, di sini kita perlu memberikan penekanan atau memberikan eh, semacam eh, ini ya advokasi pada pemerintah bahwa pendengaran ini sangat penting. Karena tadi sudah dijelaskan semua, saya kira sudah sangat jelas. Dan e, juga ada, e, kita perlu melakukan suatu tindakan yang bersifat sensitize. Ya. Sensitize untuk e, para tenaga kesehatan kita, baik e, mulai dari primary care sampai e, terujukan ke rumah sakit e, di atasnya, di level atasnya. Karena e, selama ini ternyata, Uh, untuk screening pendengaran bayi baru lahir ini memang banyak yang belum mempunyai alatnya. Kemudian kalau punya alat banyak yang sudah rusak juga ya dokter Pras ya. <laughs> Jadi itu permasalahannya. Jadi tadi uh, saya mengutip ini tadi yang dari Peter ya bahwa uh, quality quality dari uh, alat tersebut ya. Kemudian leadership ini juga sangat penting sehingga suatu program ini harus dijalankan dengan sungguh-sungguh dan mungkin kalau memang nanti bisa diterapkan secara luas di Indonesia sangat bagus sehingga kita bisa langsung mendapatkan data yang kita dapatkan selama ini kan masih tahun 1996 yaitu penelitiannya Dr. Roni yang ini ya sudah sangat lama sekali dan mungkin sudah tidak sesuai ya dengan kondisi sekarang tapi kita masih belum punya data yang realnya sehingga kalau memang dengan alat tracking ya kemudian dengan menyimpan data dan sebagainya yang saya ambil contoh yaitu semasa kita covid ya pada masa pandemi itu ternyata bisa ini terlaksana 
siapa saja yang terkena COVID langsung di uh, statusnya itu langsung jadi hitam ya nggak bisa ke mana-mana di blok dan sebagainya. Nah kalau bisa diterapkan untuk uh, screening pendengaran bayi baru lahir ini kan sangat bagus sehingga e, bisa kita lacak dan tentunya e, di Jawa Timur ini kita mempunyai resource center tadi yang sudah e, dibuat ya wadahnya untuk e, menjembatani antara orang tua, masyarakat dan langsung tenaga kesehatan dan juga tenaga e, pendidikan sehingga di sini sangat bagus sekali sehingga mereka mempunyai suatu e, engage ya dengan dengan e, orang tua, anak, kemudian e, bisa melakukan motivasi seperti posyandu begitu tapi ini lebih terstruktur karena bisa melakukan pemeriksaan pendengaran juga. Jadi e, peran dari resource center ini sangat penting yang nantinya untuk bisa membantu untuk follow up yang e, hasil-hasil nanti itu. Kemudian e, kita e, mempunyai persepsi bahwa universal newborn hearing screening ini nonsense ya, sesuatu yang tidak mungkin kita lakukan pada saat ini karena e, ya dari pemerintah belum ada regulasi, kemudian ada sebagian yang e, katanya melakukan pemeriksaan kalau bayi sehat itu tidak di cover BPJS. Nah ini ini berbagai macam isu ini sehingga kemudian e, untuk ini untuk e, coverage dari BPJS itu sendiri kan semacam roti gitu ya kalau dibagi makin banyak orang kan <laughs> jadi makin kecil ya sehingga ini juga menyebabkan misalnya e, sulit untuk mengkonsulkan untuk e, mengkonsulkan pada kita ya sehingga ini hal-hal yang mungkin e, perlu dipikirkan untuk di pemangku kebijakan bahwa e, ya Perlu dipikirkan bahwa universal newborn hearing screen ini mesti dilakukan. Karena apa? Kita sudah e, tanpa melakukan ini maka kita akan bisa lolos ya. Antara 50-60 persen tadi, kemudian e, kita tidak bisa melakukan pada semua bayi ini sudah menghilangkan hak mereka. Ya, hak untuk mendengar dan sebagainya. Dimana kalau sudah terjadi maka orang tua dan sebagainya itu e, pasti e, sangat menyesal. Kenapa dulu kok tidak ada yang melakukan pemeriksaan? Kenapa kok ya. tidak ada yang pernah memberitahu bahwa tuli itu bisa ditangani dan sebagainya? Ini seringkali terjadi kalau kita sudah berhadapan dengan e, orang tua. Nah ini culture budaya kita juga demikian. Jadi perlu ada pendekatan-pendekatan yang khusus. Nah untuk itu... Mungkin ya ini menjadi suatu wawasan bagi kita bahwa ada yang e, metode semacam ini yaitu melakukan tracking, follow up, dan e, menjaga bahwa pemeriksaannya adalah high quality dan sebagainya. Ya, ya kebetulan ini Prof. Catherine e, kita propose menjadi ejang profesor kita sehingga Beliau sangat concern dan juga untuk uh, sebagai pilot project ya paling tidak dari Jawa Timur uh, kita bisa melakukan pemeriksaan ini yang nantinya akan bisa uh, hasilnya diimplementasikan untuk seluruh Indonesia demikian ya. Ya terima kasih Prof Nyilo uh, sangat sangat menarik ya harapnya ke depan kerjasama dengan beliau berdua bisa diterapkan di. Baik, eh, terima kasih Prof. Nilo untuk kebetulan mungkin Bapak Ibu juga bisa eh, mendengarkan dan memahami apa yang disampaikan Prof. Nilo. Uh, because we are having very limited time, so we can only answer one question uh, here. Maybe one question from Mr. Peter and one question from Prof. Nilo. And just please answer for a very short only. So for Mr. Peter, is there any path app now available in Indonesia to control or track the patient? Is the service already available or maybe there is is there any similar one that we can use to track the patient uh, you you're asking for a solution if we have some solution which is already installed in indonesia yeah so the question is is there any app application now in available in indonesia available yes but not installed oh, but not we want to we, we wanted to wait <laughs> for this pilot project yeah? but of course it's a question of two hours to install it but okay. it's available and as well and and the original language and so 
Yes, thank you. So, so with the question is to Mr. Andy, so it will be, we are really looking forward to have the, such an app to be installed in Indonesia. So last question from Professor Newman, is there any ways that the new phone that has the UAE uh, uh, auto, auto acoustic emission test, but still have a problem with their hearing? If there is, how do we respond to that? So if we have... Uh, could you repeat it? Is there any... Uh... What? Uh, yes. So, is there any possibility or any risk that newborn or yeah. baby that pass the auto acoustic emission test, yeah. they, 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 he can consider yeah. to be healthy or no problem? However, actually, they still have problem with their hearing. Yes. Uh, how do we respond that? Yes, we have the quite rare but not too rare auditory neuropathy, auditory synaptopathy, uh, which uh, uh, affects about one tenth or up to up to one tenth of all children with sensory neural hearing loss, and they pass the uh, TEOE screening, but have a hearing loss, and uh, because. Um, most or many of them have additional risks. It is an international guideline that um, uh, uh, babies at risk for hearing loss, for example, preterm babies who are on the NICUs, um, uh, neonatal intensive care units, they get an AABR screening, which uh, screens the auditory pathway up to the um, auditory brainstem, and then you will cover those children. And if babies are suspect of, of, of hearing loss, you always do a kind of ABR or AABR to uh, uh, not uh, leave out the auditory neuropathy, auditory synaptopathies. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Newman, for the answer. I hope Mr. Andre Tunda, one who asked the, the question, is satisfied. So thank you very much, Professor Newman, or Mr. Peter, Dr. Adeline, Dr. Asadi, and Prof. Newman for the uh, knowledge for the presentations, very outstanding and extravagant. I hope uh, the participants here can reap the benefits. Terima kasih saya ucapkan kepada seluruh partisipan dan pada pembicara dan partisipan yang telah bergabung. Mohon maaf sekali karena waktu memang terbatas, jadi tidak semua pertanyaan bisa dijawab termasuk. We have also just statement and question from Mr. Chris Hamburg. Thank you very much. Chris, Wonderworth. Thank you very much for your comments in the chat box. Um, uh, kita mohon kesediaan Profesor Yuno mungkin juga untuk menjawab satu pertanyaan terakhir nanti lewat chat box Prof masih ada satu lagi bagaimana tentang habilitasi anda yang terlambat jadi bapak ibu sekalian mohon izin uh, kita menekankan kembali dari hasil diskusi dan kuliah yang disampaikan oleh Profesor Newman, Mr. Peter dan Profesor Yuno tadi bahwa memang universal newborn screening itu menjadi salah satu impian yang perlu diestabiliskan secara efisien. Dan sebagai penekanannya, universal neuron screening bukan hanya screeningnya saja, tetapi kemudian bagaimana melakukan follow up pencatatan datanya dan tindak lanjutnya. Memang berbagai macam tantangan masih ada, masuk di antaranya adalah economical impact seperti ketersediaan alat, bantuan, ketersediaan alat diagnostik, support dari government, dan policy memang uh, belum selalu mendukung tentang bagaimana deteksi gangguan ini, tetapi Uh, maka itu diperlukan semacam tim kecil ya seperti sampaikan Prof. Laksono di awal webinar ini untuk terus mengawal, terus melakukan studi yang kemudian bisa menjadi evidence evidence yang akan dipakai untuk membentuk suatu kebijakan yang bisa mendukung program ini agar dapat terlaksana dengan baik dengan harapan bisa mengurangi uh, efek dari gangguan pendengaran di usia anak yang sudah terlambat yang nanti kemudian jadi pasien saya rata-rata ya ya jangan sampai jadi pasien saya begitu ya semuanya harus sehat-sehat. Nah, Bapak Ibu sekalian saya ucapkan banyak terima kasih uh, untuk kesetiaan yang menemani diskusi kita sampai sore hari ini. Thank you very much for your participation and attention. Um, uh, we apologize if there is any uh, mistakes and uh, we would like to return the uh, the stage to the moderator. And all the staff ceremony. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Dian, and we are out. Thank you. Terima kasih.
Thank you so much for all the speakers, moderator, and discussants for the webinars today. And ladies and gentlemen, now we have arrived at the end of today's webinar. The materials and also the video recording can be accessed via website Kebijakan Kesehatan Indonesia. And you can also follow our information through Instagram at PKMK FKM, FKUGM and Twitter at PKMK UGM underscore. Finally, on the behalf of the entire team, I would like to sincerely apologize for the things that may be unpleasing during the webinar session. That's all for today. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you next time. Recording stopped. So I have to leave the meeting because my next meeting already started.